Hello and welcome to another video from me, Rough Swordsman Wargamer. As you can see, the next game on the table is Across the Bug River, published by VUCA Simulations and designed by K. Bianaki. Apologies if I've uh, mispronounced your name, sir. We're going to be playing one of the shorter scenarios. There are actually three in the game, two shorter ones of three turns each, and the main campaign scenario, which has a seven turn duration. The short scenario we're doing is entitled Attack of the Third Motorized Corps, and I thought I'd pick a shorter scenario rather than the main campaign because of the length of time that would take to video. But as you'll see, there's plenty going on for you, hopefully, to get an idea how the game works. Disclaimer, as always, this is not a detailed tutorial. This is me showing you my playthrough and having fun and hopefully helping you decide whether or not this game is for you. OK, let's get set up. As you can see, this small scenario only uses the top left hand corner of the map. and That, of course, makes it easier for me to video. But if you're new to the game, is an ideal introduction to it. And this scenario recreates the border battle in the first 36 hours of this part of Operation Barbarossa. And the main task of the German 3rd Motorized Corps is capturing Vladimir Volinsky, which is right here. There are other Victory Point locations, because this is a Victory Point based game, and to help us keep tabs of those, the game is supplied with these victory point counters, which we'll put on the map. There we go, quite a lot for the Germans to think about. And like most games with these victory point locations, the player controls the VP hex if that side was the last to occupy it, and they can trace a line free of enemy units and enemy zones of control from his supply source to the VP Hex. And the supply sources for the Germans are over in the west side of the map and the south. And for the Soviets, they've got their supply sources north, south and east of the map. Included with the game are some fantastic player aids on heavy card. And on one of them, there is an explanation of the units so I think we'll have a quick look at that and a quick run over what all the numbers on the counters mean. So here's an example of an infantry unit. And for the Soviets, it's the same except for the colors. We've got the formation stripe color at the top. We've got their divisional symbol there and their unit ID and the unit type. And if you're not sure what those are, that's all explained in the rules. On the left hand side here, we have a number which they call the effectiveness, which is like, I suppose, their morale and their efficiency. And down the bottom left, we've got the combat strength of the unit, their movement allowance. And as you can see, it's white, which denotes it's a leg unit. And in the middle, their anti-tank points, if any. On the other side, they'll have a stripe, which denotes that unit is disrupted, can't do much at all, can't move, which is why it's got a D there in the movement allowance circle. Their strength and effectiveness doesn't change, but their anti-tank points do. Slightly different for armored fighting vehicles. Again, with the formation color stripe, unit ID, unit type is actually a picture in this case of the tank, effectiveness down on the left hand side again, combat strength, movement allowance this time is in red, which denotes it's motorized because terrain has an effect, as you probably know, for leg and motorized units. And in the middle, they have tank points. And here's the disrupted side. There are also HQ units. HQ units have different characteristics, if you like, to the fighting units. HQ units are not combat units, and they can't be activated when combat units of that formation are activated, although they can provide some HQ combat support. 
They don't move. And as you can see here, there is no movement allowance. They have to be relocated. And that's that number there. And that's how many action points that will take. And we'll go through activation and action point in a moment for that HQ to relocate to another village or town hex. That's the only hexes they can occupy. They don't project a, a ZOC, a zone of control. They may not relocate to a village or town hex that has an enemy unit in it or has an enemy zone of control, an EZOC, unless that hex already contains a friendly combat unit which will neutralize that EZOC and that combat unit can do it even if it's disrupted. And they're only removed from play when all their units that they're looking after are eliminated. They are quite important though, because every time you do something, you have to check whether or not you're in command range of your HQ. And on the left-hand side, we can see that number. And here's that combat support number, which you may or may not use depending on what type of attack you do. And in the middle there, we've got the reaction rating, which that formation will use when it's trying to do something called formation reaction actions, because this game isn't a strictly I go, you go. If you have the initiative and you move, for instance, into an enemy Zoc, that formation can then react to that. And that number here is taken into account. Right, there are four formations for the Soviet Fifth Army, and they set up first. So let's get back to the map. Stacking in the game is pretty straightforward. There is a three unit limit per hex, but only one of those may be an infantry type unit. There is one exception. Border guards and anti-tank units are not considered infantry, and they can be put in a stack with another infantry unit. And to make that easier to remember, their symbol is marked in red. HQs don't count for stacking. We are told which units the Soviets have in the scenario instructions, and we use this campaign board setup to place them on the map. We're not gonna have all of these, of course. So let's do that. Here we've got the 87th Rifle Division, and they're over here as well, so quite split up. 41st Tank Division over there. We've got the second Fortified Region in their pillboxes dotted along the Bug River there. And the NKVD Border Guard Battalions on the border. Got to be a bit careful. Some of the HQs are hidden under other HQs. You can stack two HQs in a village and up to three HQs in a town. Each formation also has an activation formation marker, which look like that. So let's quickly show you those on the tracks sheet. Here's the tracks sheet for solitaire play. As you're probably aware, most maps have the tracks on opposite sides of the map for each player. But if you're playing solitaire like me, they're all contained on this one player aid. Here are the formations involved in this scenario. And the scenario will tell you which number to place those formation activation markers on. And as each formation gets activated, we'll move that down. And when it gets to zero, they can't do anything else and they will pass. And for the next turn, we generate how many activations they'll have for that turn. Here's the action point marker, which will tell you how many action points each formation has to use. And the Soviets also get these counter attack order markers. And for this scenario, they get two. And each one of those can be removed if the Soviets do something called a prepared attack. Otherwise, the Germans will get extra victory points. 
prepared attacks for the Soviets is going to be quite hard because uh, basically what I thought I'd do with the Soviets is just to keep pulling back, holding up the Germans until the turns are over and uh, hopefully they won't get very many victory points. So that's the Soviets. That's the Germans placed. We have three formations. We've got the 14th Panzer Division. And all these formations are, of course, part of the 3rd Motorized Corps. We've got the 298 Infantry Division here. And the 44th Infantry Division down here. The Germans also have three Stug 3 units, part of the 191st Assault Gun Battalion. And I've placed one under here. by this bridge, you can just see that there, there is a reason for that, and two under this infantry unit here, again by a bridge, because for the first turn the Germans get some advantages attacking across those bridges which they lose in subsequent turns, but we'll come on to that later. Back at the tracks sheet, we can see now those values for the German formations. They also get an interdiction marker, which for this scenario will go on the plus one. There's their action point marker. Game turn marker, and for turn two, they will get a couple of engineering units. This initiative and DRM marker will start here. Won't uh, stay there very long. There are also two boat movement markers for the Germans and that enables two German leg units to cross an unbridged hex of the Bug River and only two leg units can do that for each formation activation. There's extra costs involved, but hopefully we'll see that as well. There's also this pontoon bridge. There's actually two, but one is for the 29th Corps, which isn't in this scenario. But to use those, the unit has to be undisrupted, be in command range of its HQ, be adjacent, of course, to the Bug River, and the hex on the other side must be free of enemy units and ESOX. And last but not least, there's this. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that or that. But that's like a good luck thing. The German player starts with this and they can cash it in to re-roll any single die roll. But then they have to give it to the Russians. That, I think, is everything. Any other bits and pieces that crop up, we'll talk about and show you those as and when. So, we're ready for turn one of Attack of the Third Motorized Corps. The sequence of play is not only on the back of the rule book, but printed here on the player aid. And as you can see, we have an admin phase, which incidentally doesn't happen in turn one. Then the ops phase, which is a sort of cycle backwards and forwards of uh, initiative, and then end of turn phase. However, for this scenario, there are a couple of special rules, one of which is the surprise attack. So instead of throwing for initiative for turn one, the Germans automatically have the initiative for the first formation activation and the Germans have two consecutive formation activations. After that, the initiative plus DRM marker is moved to the plus two, showing the Soviet side. We'll look at that in a moment. For this free activation for the Germans, only infantry divisions can be activated, and each only once. So if you remember, we have two infantry formations here, and the tank division. So these two are going to be activated. 
Also, just for turn one, there is this special rule concerning the Brandenburg Regiment and attacks across the Bug River at these two bridges here and here, where I put those independent tank units, only have a minus two DRM to combat and armoured fighting vehicles have half tank points instead of the minus four DRM and the quarter tank points. And that, if you see here on the terrain effects chart, the tank points would only be a quarter and minus four to the DRM, but down here for the first turn only, minus two and half tank points. So what I think we'll do first is do an attack across this bridge here and see if we can start pushing forward. First, we're gonna find out how many action points that German formation has. So as you can see, the 44th Infantry Division here is on number six. We now throw a D10. Just see if I can fit that in there. See what they get. They get, oh, it's a good throw, an eight. Then we look on this action point chart and cross-reference the six with the eight. And we get six action points. We use this black number here. The red number is used when the non-initiative player is successful with a formation reaction, which if you remember, occurs when an enemy unit moves into their zone of control. So six action points for the Germans for that formation. Let's see what we can do with those. So we are going to attack across this Vygodanka bridge, which gives us some advantages in the first turn. But now we have to decide what type of attack we're doing. And if we look on the player aid, the action point costs, we can do three types of attack. Also shows you what else you can do with your action points. So hasty, regular or prepared attack. And as you probably guessed, because the prepared attack costs more, that's going to be a bit better to do. You also get full combat support from your HQ. Whereas a regular attack, you'd only get half that amount and a hasty attack, nothing at all. The other thing is on the combat chits, as you'll see in a moment, there are three columns, one for hasty, one for regular and one for prepared. And generally speaking, the prepared attack column has a better modifier on it, but not always. As we've got six action points, I think we'll do a prepared attack. And what I tend to do is to take them off. And just put that there to remind me where it was. And the same with the Soviets. And we'll have a look at combat. On the back of the rule book is a nice combat sequence for you to follow. So we'll just zoom in a bit and we'll go through that sequence. So the Germans have decided to do a prepared attack, which costs three APs. And we should have also seen if we were in command range of our HQ, but as we've only just started, that HQ is only two hexes away, so yes, now we have to determine the combat multiplier, and that's done by drawing one of these for each side, which we'll do. Germans. And the Soviets. There are four columns. The first column is the value of the unit's effectiveness, which is this number here. So for the Germans, it's a five, so we'll be using this row here. If by chance those units had different effectivenesses, you'd still use the same counter, but just use the other number. 
first column is for a hasty attack. The middle column is for a regular attack. And here's our one prepared. And as you can see, we've got a, an effectiveness of five. And so we have a multiplier of three. And you multiply the combat value of the units. So we've got eight times three plus two times three, which is 24 plus six, which is 30. Now for the Soviets, their effectiveness is only two. So we'll just turn that over to the other side. And we'll be using this row here. For defense, they mean slightly different things. The first column is if that unit is disrupted, which it isn't. The middle column is for a regular defense. And the last column is used when they have an improved defense, if they have one of these on them. But they don't, so they'll be using the middle uh, column. They have an efficiency of two. And in the middle there, oh, it's just the one. So that stays a one. So it's 30 to one. Oh, dear. That's our ratio. Now we have to do DRM determinations. So hexide terrain effects. Well, we're attacking across that bridge. And normally, as I showed you earlier, across the bridged Bug River, tank points are divided by four, and there is a minus four DRM anyway because of the attack across the bridge. But in the first turn, it becomes a two, minus two DRM and only half tank points. We'll see those in a moment. So a minus two DRM to that 30 to one roll we do. Combat support. And that's where our HQ comes in. A prepared attack means we can use all of the HQ's support. Regular is only half, hasty, nothing at all. So here's the value we'll be using. So that's a plus five. So at the moment we are plus three because of that minus two. If the Germans had any units adjacent to the units we are attacking, we may get combat support, but we, we didn't, so we can ignore that. And the last DRM is armor superiority. And the armor value is here. If there is more than one, you take the highest value and you look at the anti-tank value of the, of the other side and take one away from the other. And that's your DRM. So we've got four there, minus zero. That's their anti-tank value. So we have a plus four, but that's got to be halved because we're tacking across the Bug River Bridge. So that is two. So we get a plus five overall to our die roll. I think that's how it goes. I hope so. So let's have a look at the combat results table. Here we are, and we have this handy dandy little uh, marker to help us keep track of where we are. The enemy is actually in a village. So we line that up with the village here. And we are right across there at 10 to 1. That's the highest we can go. Let's throw a die and see what we get. Oh, crikey. It's a nine. Yeah, and we've got a plus five, so that's 14. Oh dear, right down here. The first number is the attacker's result. The second number is the defender's result. If the result is red and underlined, that means that all the units that get that result have to take an effectiveness check. But I don't think we'll be doing that because as you can see, I hope, they are going to take four combat hits. And that poor border guard unit only has one.
combat value, so it is eliminated. Oh, something I forgot to do. When we activated that formation, we should have moved their marker down one. They've got five activations left, and we used three action points. So we've got three left. Also, the side that receives the lower combat hit number in a combat wins the battle and gets something called battle victory. And they receive one bonus action point, which that stack can use immediately. So let's get back to the map. So that border guard unit has been removed from the map and our extra battle victory action point, I think we'll use to move this stack across the bridge. We can only go as fast as the slowest unit. So this has got three movement points. So that'll be one, that'll be two. Now we can't go here because of the woods, not enough movement points. What we could do, we could move here with our last movement point and this unit will have the option to do a formation reaction attempt. And if they try that, you look at their HQ, they're in command range and they've got a throw under a five. But because of this surprise attack, they will get a plus two to that, so doesn't look likely. And if they're not successful, we could attack or we could keep that there. Or we could start getting some more units across with our other three action points. Well, let's move up. We don't have to attack. Let's move up for our third movement point. And I think the Soviets will attempt formation reaction and we can show you how that works so as I said we look to see if they're in command range they are they've got a command range of eight their reaction rating is five but they have got a plus two to that die roll because of the surprise attack I'll have to throw off camera they get a three Plus the two is five, and it has to be equal or lower. So yes, they can react. So let's see how many action points this formation gets. So I think it's under here, there it is. They are on three. So let's see what they throw. They throw, oh, it's a good throw, seven. Their activation level is three and they threw a seven. So they're using this number here, this red number. They get two action points. Just pop those there. Their formation marker gets moved down one. Unfortunately, that's the only downside. So let's see what they're going to do. So they've got a few options. Not worth attacking. But they could move into here. Remember, these can stack because they are the red border guards. They can stack with other infantry units. We could relocate this HQ. It's a little bit exposed if a unit comes next to it and it's on its own, it will have to be displaced to another town or village. And normally they would lose one of their attack support points, but they haven't got any, so I don't think they would lose any more. But more worrying is that formation would have to move its formation activation marker down one box. So they won't get so many activations. They're already at two because of this formation reaction. They can move up to eight away. So we could pull it back here. Let's do that. And the last one, we could pull this one back or this one back into the pillbox there, or we could 
put an improved marker on one of those to hold them up. There's only these two units in this formation. So let's pull. This is going to get activated next. Let's pull these back into here. So that's it. We're back with the Germans who still have their three action points left. I think we'll start getting some units across. So we'll move this unit in. One, two, three for another action point. Two left. And we'll boat this one across to show you how that works with our little uh, boat movement. It costs an extra movement point to use that. So this one, what do we say? So what one shall we do? Let's do this one because it's furthest away from. So we'll move that across. So that's two. Could move it there, but they may do a reaction. Yeah, let's do it. So they got five. Just to keep everything clear. Will they do a formation reaction? I think they will. They're going to try that again. It is with a minus two still. So they have to throw five or less with a, sorry, a plus two. No, they get a nine. So they don't react. We'll do another boat movement. We'll get this one across. So that'll be two, three, one action point left. Let's bring that one up there. Right, that's the Germans lot for that formation. It is now the Germans second free activation with this surprise attack. So we're going to activate this formation. So let's get down to the track sheet and see how many action points that formation gets. So the 298, their formation activation level is six. Let's see what we get. Don't get that there. Oh, oops. Six. And a six, it's a good one again. It's another six. Move that down. Okay, six action points. So I will just remove those. What we'll do is, I think we will try and push across here. Now I've forgotten what's under that uh, Soviet stack and we're not allowed to have a look. We can see their HQ on top, but we're gonna have to try and push through not sure how successful we'll be. As before, we can't have combat support from this adjacent unit because it's across the Bug River and units for combat support have to project a Zoc and you don't across the Bug River. So it'll just be these guys on their own. So I think we've got to be a bit lucky, but we'll give it a go. We're going to do a prepared attack again. So that'll be three action points, taking us down to three left. So let's see what happens this time. Take these off. Pop my little cubes there. It's a victory point hex. So here are the units involved in the combat. We've got for the Germans, a unit of the 298 Infantry Division and these independent Stugs attached to that division. And for the Soviets, we've got a Border Guard HQ, but that won't take any part in the combat. We've got a Border Guard unit and a unit of the 87th Rifle Division. We will be using the combat sequence on the back of the rule book, and so, it says attack declaration. As I said earlier, we are doing a prepared attack. 
Next, it's determine the combat multiplier. And so we're going to choose a combat chit. This time we do have different effectiveness values, but we'll use the same chit. We'll just look at the different number on the chit. So we'll do the Germans first. We are using this. This has an effectiveness of four, so the multiplier is two. So that is 16. And for the two Stugs, we're gonna use the other side. That's a bit better three so that's six a piece so that's another 12 that's 28 and for the soviets now they're going to be using the middle column for a regular defense so for the four they've got a multiplier of two so that's 12 and on this one oh it's just one so another one so that's 28 to 13 so that'll be two to one, not great. Next, DRM determination, hexide terrain effects. If you remember from the other combat, for the first turn only, because of this surprise attack the Germans are doing, there is only a minus two DRM, as opposed to minus four. So we've got a minus two. Combat support, well, even though there is a unit adjacent to the hex being attacked, we can't use it because it's the wrong side of the Bug River. There is no Zoc across the Bug River, so they can't be used. HQ attack support, though, we can. And so we are getting the full whack, which is going to be five. So that makes the DRM a plus three. Armor superiority. We've got two this time, so it doesn't matter which one we'll pick. We'll pick this one. And for the Soviets, they've got to use that. That's got the highest anti-tank. We have to halve our tank points during the first turn. Next turn, if we're tacking across the Bug River with armor, it will be a quarter of that value. So that's halved, so we're two. This has one, but I think I forgot last time, on the terrain effects chart here for village, which is where they are, they get a plus one to the defending anti-tank. That bumps them up to two. So two minus two, zero. Nothing for armor superiority. So there we go, two to one with a plus three. It's over to the combat results table. So we are already lined up for the village. Two to one, plus three to the die roll. Good grief, nine. Nine plus three, 12. The Germans get one combat hit. The Soviets get two, and they have to do an effectiveness check. We can get rid of these now. Work out the damage. The defenders always do theirs first, so two hits. The first hit always has to be a step loss, if you like, a loss on their combat value. So that goes down to five, and we'll use one of these, and we'll pop the five upwards to let everybody know that's the value now. And now it's the effectiveness check. It's rolled against their effectiveness, of course, but because we're still in the first turn, and that surprise attack, all Soviet effectiveness checks and reaction checks have a plus two DRM. Oh dear. Right. Not sure I won't get that into shot. So for the rifle unit here, they need to throw four or less with a plus two. Nope, they threw a three. Plus two is five, they have failed. They have to be disrupted and get turned over. 
This one isn't going to make it, regardless of what we throw. It's going to have a plus two to it. Six plus two is eight. They get disrupted as well. Now, according to the rules, it says any unit that failed an effectiveness check due to a red result, which it was, is forced to retreat. So these two are forced to retreat. The only good thing is, if all the units involved in the combat retreat, they can nullify the second combat hit. So they don't get any more damage, but they will have to retreat when we're back on the map. Now for the Germans, one hit. Again, we have to take that as a combat hit on our combat value. And it has to be the armor unit that was involved. I think if there are no armor units involved, the player can choose which one. But this one will take a hit. They've only got two. They are now down to one. But no effectiveness check. There we are. I think that's how you do it. Back to the map. So here we are, the units are back. These, remember, have to withdraw. Let's take that off for a minute. They can retreat one or two hexes. There are no mechanized units, so they can move across this stream, I think. No, they'll go back one. Can they retreat? No. Can't split them up either. They've got to retreat as a stack. So they'll retreat there. This HQ doesn't move. It doesn't have any movement points. It is now on its own next to enemy units and is displaced. So we have to see which town or hex this can be displaced to. So it has a command range of eight, but we have to be able to find a path free from the Germans' zones of control. We're okay because these don't exert a zone of control because they're on the wrong side of the Bug River. So where do we want that? Probably best here, I suppose, out the way. So we'll pop it there. Unfortunately, because it's been displaced rather than relocated in its activation, we have to subtract one from the HQ's current attack support point total but they're already zero so we can't do that however we also have to move the corresponding formation activation marker down one box and so that formation will lose an activation so i'll do that they are now down to two activations and there we are However, because the Germans received the lower combat hit number, they get a battle victory action point, which they can use. Only units involved in the combat may use this action point, and they've got to be in command range of their parent HQ, which of course is here. So I think we'll move. We've got three movement points. So that's one. Just checking to see if there's any... Extra terrain costs going across the bridged Bug River. No, it's other terrain. That's a village and it's one movement point. We have to stop now because we are next to a Soviet unit who may decide to do a formation reaction. And you know what? I think they will. It's not disrupted. No. And it is in command range of its HQ. Yes. There she is. 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. They have to throw, uh, it's going to be awkward, they have to throw four or less, but if you remember from earlier, they're going to get a plus two on that because we are still in the first turn. And that surprise attack gives a plus two DRM to these formation reaction attempts as well. So we'll see what happens. They've got to throw two or less, I suppose. I'm going to have to do this off camera, you have to trust me. Here we go. Six, no, it's no good. So they failed because that was unsuccessful. We can carry on moving. And because only one 
reaction attempt can be made per initiative formations movement action. If we move here, they can't do a formation reaction again. Now, do we move that, that far out? Yeah, let's try it. So we're going to move here. Because, it, as I say, that's the same movement action. They can't react. So we'll leave it there. So what are the Germans going to do? They've got three action points. I don't think they want to attack with this anymore. Maybe prudent to try and get some units over the Bug River. They may incur some more formation reactions. But best to do it now while the Germans still have that plus two DRM during this surprise attack phase. So bring this across here. They're sort of blocked in, aren't they? They need to push forward. Also, I want to try and keep the formations together. I don't want to start splitting them off this way and that way because we're going to have problems then keeping them in command range. So I tell you what, we'll try a boat movement with this one. So that's two. And one of these will do a formation reaction attempt. Now, as I said earlier, only one Reaction formation attempt may be made per movement action. So if these fail, the Germans can carry on moving an extra hex. So we'll have this one try. Its HQ is up there. It's in command range. There are no broken command paths because of enemy EZOX. So they need four or less, but with a plus two. No eight, crikey, no luck. So these can carry on moving for three and they can't do anything about it. Next one. So, so yes, it's quite blocked here. Try and get these to get them out of the way. I might try and move this one here. They can't do anything if we move along the river. I think we'll go one, another boat movement, two, three. Now they can do a formation reaction attempt because it's a different movement action. And I think we'll try this one again. And the Soviets thinking is that if they can get some action points, they're gonna try and improve those positions to make it a little bit harder for the Germans to dislodge them. So here we go, four or less, but with a plus two again. No, they're not having much luck, six. The Germans have got one more action point. We can't boat any more across. So I think we'll just go one, two. But once again, this unit can do a formation reaction. Again with four, ah, hold on. Are they in? Yes, they can go for it around here. One, two, three, four, five, six. I think that's okay. Oh dear, oh dear, eight. So no luck and the Germans are out of action points. And that is the end of the free activations, the surprise attack for the Germans. And you know what? I think I'll leave it there. It's gone on quite a while with the setup and explaining things. But next time we might be able to truck along a bit faster. And remember, I'm still learning the game. So there we are. When we return in the next video, both sides will now roll for initiative. The Germans will have plus one to their die roll due to the interdiction, but the Soviets will have a plus two on the initiative and DRM track. So it's anybody's guess what will happen next. Germans are quite pleased, I think, because they've pushed through both bridges. They've yet to activate their panzers. A bit awkward for them, 
because they've got the forest and the marsh. Ideally, they would have liked to push through this way, but because of the traffic jam here with the reserves, it might be easier to come round here. We shall see. So this has been part one of a playthrough of Across the Bug River, Volodymyr Volinsky, 1941. A game published by VUCA Simulations and designed by Krzysztof Bianetsky. Well, I hope you found that interesting and you enjoyed it. If you did and it was and you haven't done so already, it would help tremendously if you would consider subscribing to the channel. I know I mention it every time, but it really does help. Also of great help is if you would push the like button, the old thumbs up of this video. And if you want to be informed of other content the channel uploads, then push the bell. Leave a comment. You know me. I may have made a few little boo-boos. If I have, please let us know because it helps everybody. And as I said earlier, I'm still learning the game. Also, is this the first time you've come across this game? If so, what do you think? And as I always say, has it piqued your interest? Again, let me know. I love to read them. Thanks as always to my subscribers. Thank you very much. And one last thing. If you want to support the channel a little bit further, well, now you can. You can buy the channel a coffee. And all those coffees go towards helping the channel to upload new content. If you want to check that out, I will leave a link in the description and thank you. So what will happen in part two? We'll have to wait and find out. So until then, as always, you take care and goodbye.